Since Simon Winchester wrote The Man Who Loved China, I've been waiting for the next book that he wrote that touches on China. Because it was such a pleasure to read that book and to hear his talk that he gave at the National Committee that I keep, kept waiting for it. So it was, what, about 12 months ago that we were having dinner? Yes. That, yes. that we were having dinner, and Simon said he was writing this book on the Pacific, and he told me it was going to include this portion on the South China Sea. And we immediately said, OK, we're going to do a book program. <laughs> and one of the great parts about my job is I get to read all these books, and it's part of my job. And this is really an undertaking and a pleasure. It Wonderfully, it starts right around three days before I was born. <laughs> and that's how he marks everything. So I assume that's kind of, that was, there, there's some causal effect there. And touches on a lot of the issues that, that we care a lot about. But it's, you know, Simon has written many other books, but I, I would take up the entire time if I listed all of the books and gave all the compliments that they deserve. But really, one of the great authors of our time, it's a pleasure to, to, uh, to have with us today, Simon Winchester. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much indeed. It's, it's very nice indeed to be back. I, I'm told that uh, after 30 minutes, I'll be told to shut up. So we're going to make this as economical as possible. Um, although economy is not an easy thing to deal with when you're dealing with the Pacific, 64 million square miles, vast entity. Um, the, the structure of this, well, the basic, the driving thesis of the book is, is very simple, that the, um, the, the Mediterranean was the inland sea of the classical world, and if you agree with that, uh, then you can reasonably say that the Atlantic was the inland sea of the modern world. <coughs> If you accept that thesis, which I advanced in a book I did about the Atlantic about uh, six years ago, then the Pacific can rightly be thought of as the inland sea of tomorrow's world. I, mean, I know it's become something of a cliche, but nonetheless, that's what I wanted to uh, sort of inquire into, whether this was really likely to be the case. And so, because it is so vast, and because I wanted to look at tomorrow rather than yesterday, I decided to begin the story not with Balboa, and not with Magellan, and not with Captain Cook, and not with Dampier and all those early explorers, but begin much more um, close to modern times. And in choosing a date which seemed suitable to begin the story, I first of all thought that the uh, surrender of the Japanese on the Missouri on the 2nd of uh, September 1945 might be a suitable date. Also, the, the 10th of October 1949, the founding of the PRC might be a great hinge moment in history, which had huge implications to the Pacific and the world generally. But in the end, I came up with another date which seemed, which had was sort of almost poetically beguiling, and that was the 1st of January 1950. Uh, and the reason for that um, has all to do with radiochemistry, because um, well, first of all, it has to do with the dating system that we're accustomed to use, BC and AD. I mean, this is 2015, and if I remember my schoolboy history correctly, the, the Romans invaded Britain in 55 BC, before Christ, and then Anno Domini. But of course, the trouble with that, that dating system is that we're not all Christians, and some people find that offensive, many few find it irrelevant. So there's been this fudge in the last 30 or 40 years to use the convention BCE, which for people with a lingering affection for Christianity uh, say it means before Christian era and those of a more secular bent before common era. But that didn't do it for the scientific community who came up with a completely different convention for dealing with things that happened a long time ago. And that convention was summed up by the letters BP. You talk about the Wisconsin Ice Age having occurred 10,000 years BP. BP meaning, of course, before present. But that then prompts the question, well, when is present? And that was defined by radiochemists, actually at Queen's University in Belfast, 
as being the 1st of January 1950. And for a very simple reason, although it will take 90 seconds, 90 valuable seconds, to explain, um, all to do with carbon-14 dating. Because I think you all will remember from school that there's a well-known ratio between the amount of carbon-12 in the atmosphere, in carbon dioxide, of course, and the amount of carbon-14, carbon-12 being stable, carbon-14 being unstable and having a half-life of 7,530 years. So you know what the ratio is. It's about a trillion atoms of carbon-12 to one atom of carbon-14. And if a tree dies a long time ago and stops absorbing carbon dioxide, then the amount of carbon dioxide or carbon in its tissues, the ratio will be different from that in the atmosphere because the amount of carbon-14 has been reducing by half every 7,530 years. And so with a very easy calculation, you can work out when it was that the tree died. And that was all fine and dandy, so long as you knew what that base ratio was, a trillion to one. And until 1950, that was fixed. But then in 1950, we started the atmospheric testing big time of nuclear weapons. And one of the byproducts of both fission and fusion bombs is carbon-14. So we were pumping huge amounts of carbon-14 into the atmosphere. And this was noticed almost immediately by people who were dating things and realized that the calculations were going completely haywire. So they had to introduce an algorithm of ever increasing strength as the years went by. And they sort of tore their hair out and began to think that carbon-14 was a useless way of dating things. And they would use other devices like rubidium strontium. So basically, they came to the conclusion that before the January the 1st, 1950, which they used as the index moment for this event, the world was pure. And after 1950, when Steve was born, so sorry, an element of impurity was introduced in ever-increasing amounts into the atmosphere. And so they decided that that would be used as the index year for dating, and I would use it as the index year, the start year, for my book, because, as it happened, nearly all of the material was thrown up by testing in and around the Pacific Ocean. So I began the story in 1950, and I ended it, for reasons I won't really discuss unless it comes up in the Q&A, on the 14th of May, 2014. So I had 64 years of recent time to play with. And how then to corral everything that seemed important in the Pacific into a manageable structure, because I have this firm belief that when you're writing big books about big topics, there are three crucially important elements. The first is, of course, the idea. You've got to have a good idea for the book. But the second, it's tempting to think that good writing will carry the book. Uh, and I don't believe that's true at all. Good writing is important. It's nice if the book is written nicely. But the second most important thing is the structure of the book. You've got to have a good structure. You can write lyrically poetically about a wonderful idea, but if the structure is uh, incoherent, then people will just go to sleep. So I had to come up with a decent structure for this book. And what I decided to do, once having got the beginning and the end of the, the markets to the story, to scour the newspapers and magazines and scientific journals and every document I could come across to find any events of significance that occurred in and around the ocean in those 64 years and then winnow them down first to 200. I, I think I selected just about 290. 200, 150, and finally to 10 events that seem to me to betoken trends that when you took them all and looked at the Pacific in a sort of quantalist way, would give you a portrait of both how the Pacific is configured today and how it's likely to develop in the future. And so to give you an example, I mean, the, the events, the 10 events that I chose, I arranged them reasonably enough in, in, in uh, chronological order. The first one being, it occurred just four days after uh, the 1st of January, or the 4th of January, when President Truman stood up and gave his, was that your actual birthday? Yes. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Well, many congratulations. Um, That's why President Truman made that announcement. He, he did indeed. He was straight from the hospital, I did so. Um, made a State of the Union address in which he made a number of announcements, of course, but the two most significant from this book's point of view is that the United States was going to develop this new super 
super bomb, which the physicists said would be possible to construct, which was a hydrogen bomb, a thermonuclear weapon, and that they were going to test these devices in the real estate, the huge amount of real estate that had been acquired at the end of the Second, the Second World War by the United States, and probably most specifically in the Marshall Islands, and ultimately, of course, in Bikini. And so I tell him in great detail in that first chapter, which is called the Great Thermonuclear Sea, how the Pacific became defined as the testing ground, not, not only, of course, for the United States, but also for the United Kingdom and France testing nuclear weapons. The second chapter, and I'm not going to go through them all because I want to linger on the tenth chapter, given, given the audience here. Um, the second chapter relates to the appearance in a store in, of all places, Edmonton, Alberta, um, an electronics store on Jasper Avenue in 1955, August the 8th, of a small shirt pocket sized electronic device, a transistor radio, the first ever transistor radio, went on sale in Edmonton and Winnipeg and Vancouver. It was called the TR55. It was a little bigger than a packet of cigarettes. And it had around the top the name of the manufacturer, Totsco, Tokyo Telecommunications Company. And in tiny little letters beneath the tuning dial, this new and hitherto totally unfamiliar word, Sony. It was the first <coughs> device ever marketed internationally by Sony. It sold out immediately in Canada. Because up to that point, the radio set had effectively been a piece of furniture. It was a large thing covered with walnut veneer and put an aspidistra on top of it and you turned it on and it warmed up and you tuned it in. Now all of a sudden you didn't have to do that. You could take it with you, you could take it to the beach or take it to bed or to school. You had a new relationship with a piece of electronics. And the device became enormously popular for a peculiar reason in New York, which I often think was, uh, it was actually a stunt performed by Sony because 4,000 of these radios arrived in November 1955 in a warehouse in Queens, an electronics warehouse filled with all sorts of other things. And there was a burglary that night reported in the New York Times the next morning, um, major electronics heist in Queens, page 17. And it turns out that the bolt cutters and things, no one was hurt, but the thieves went and took only the 4,000 radios made by Sony. And the New York Times reported this faithfully, that they were in lemon yellow and lime green and pink, and that they weighed six ounces or something. And immediately, of course, New Yorkers who read the paper were intrigued by this and thought, well, if it's good enough for the burglars, it's good enough for us. And they, bought, they ordered thousands of these things. As it happened, almost at exactly the same time, the shipping container was invented over in, uh, in, on the Atlantic coast. Two and two were put together within a matter of weeks. Containers manufactured in Japan, filled with these things, were beginning the trek across the Pacific in a trade route that has never since faltered from going from the ports of, first of all, Japan, and then later Korea, and nowadays, of course, mainly from China, eastwards to Vancouver and Seattle and Oakland and. Uh, and Long Beach. And so whenever you stand on the Golden Gate Bridge and see an enormous evergreen container ship steaming in towards the container terminals in Oakland, you have to remember that that all began in 1955 with the invention of one tiny radio, the TR55 transistor radio, made by a man completely forgotten these days called Masaru Ibuka, the great inventor at Sony. We all think, if we think of Sony, of that rather smooth sort of silver fox of a man, Akio Morita. But in fact, the engineers were the kings of the company. And Ibuka, a man who collected model railways and flew helium balloons, invented the transistor radio. He invented the Walkman, if you remember the Walkman. He invented the Trinitron. He invented the Betamax. And he was an astonishing inventor. And that drove this amazing trade pattern. Before I get on to chapter 10, one final thing I'll mention from the body of the book. The third chapter, which is 1959, so the first one 1950, the second 55, the next one 59, was the opening of a movie in Long Island in April the 23rd, I think it was, 1959, Shakespeare's birthday, as it happens. Um, a film that Columbia Pictures didn't really have much confidence in opening it in the big cities. 
So they opened it in the suburbs and in New York specifically in Long Island. And it was a sort of highly colored, rather faintly erotic uh, movie, which the New York Times film critic of the day went to see on the whim here. I heard a message that this might be interesting and traveled out to see it and came back transported. He thought it was a wonderful, wonderful film. And he wrote a lyrical review at the end of April 59 saying everyone was going to see this movie. The movie, if some of you might remember it, was called Gidget. And Gidget was a movie about a 15-year-old girl called Kathy Kona learning to surf. And surfing, it strikes me, is rather more than merely the Pacific's great gift to playtime. It's rather more than that. Surfing began in Tahiti. It was transported to, uh, to Hawaii in the early part of the 19th century. The missionaries then attempted to shut it down because, of course, the Hawaiians joyfully surfed naked and this completely shocked all the missionaries and their wives. So they ordered them either to wear moo-moos when they surfed, which of course they found thoroughly offensive, or else stop surfing. And effectively, they did, except for the children. Hawaiian children surfed on these tiny little surfboards called Paipo. And in 1907, Jack London happened to be in Hawaii on his voyage across the Pacific in the snark. And he and his wife were swimming off Waikiki, which was a little village in those days. And suddenly they were overtaken by scores of these adorable little Hawaiian children zipping about on the waves on these little, on these little surfboards. And he said, this is the most sublime experience. I want to learn how to do it. And he was a somewhat corpulent white man. <laughs> but he was persuaded that he could learn it. And he did eventually learn it. And he was... The moment when he actually got on top of a wave and managed to maneuver all the way to shore without falling off and appeared to be flying on the surface of the waters, he wrote this in a almost a piece of poetry, surfing the king of sports for the, late, the women's home companion in October 1907. The piece was syndicated in the Pall Mall Gazette in London, it went to Australian magazines, and suddenly surfing became a sport in and around the Pacific Ocean. Limited there to Huntington Beach and Redondo Beach and Malibu and Bondi Beach. But then came Gidget in 1959 and suddenly it became a worldwide phenomenon. And it's now not merely a $13 billion a year industry. I mean, it is a massive industry, but it's also affected and infected industry to a certain extent. It, that began the man who invented the Patagonia company, a man called Yvonne Schoenart was a very keen surfer and a very keen climber. And he decided that his workers would be happy, happier if he placed his factories on the Pacific Coast Highway. And when the surf was up, saying to his workers, off you go, go surfing. And they would surf happily through the afternoon, and then they'd come back and think what a wonderful boss he was. And they'd work late into the night, energized and happy at having done this. And they'd do it the next day and the next. And so the concept of Flex time was born with Patagonia and then spread to companies like Google and FaceTime <coughs> and Facebook and so forth. So it had an effect on management, it had an effect on industry beyond simply being the Pacific's great gift to playtime. And from a personal point of view, I'm delighted because Gidget herself uh, wrote to me the other day. She is it's a true story, of course, Gidget, Kathy Kona was her name, she's now called Kathy. Zimmerman. She's 72 years old. She lives in uh, Malibu and she surfs every day and she works in a bookshop twice a week. And uh, she happened to read my book and saw that I was saying nice, nice things about her. And so knowing that I'm going to be in Malibu on the 8th of uh, December, we're going to have lunch. So if, whatever this book does, the fact that I am going to have lunch with Gidget is to me a great, 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 great delight. And so the chapters of the book march on, a chapter about weather, a chapter about, big chapter about Australia, um, a big chapter about coal bleaching and environmental mayhem, and with one or two remarkable success stories, notably the saving of the northern short-tailed albatross by an extraordinary Japanese man called Hiroshi Hasegawa. But the, the, the chapter that culminates the book, or nearly culminates it, because I actually wanted to write an epilogue which was rather more hopeful and cheerful and optimistic in chapter 10, which is all about, uh, you're familiar with, probably much more familiar than I, uh, the quote, coming collision of the world's superpowers. 
is necessarily a somewhat uh, dismal chapter. Um, and the, it begins, uh, the chapter begins with um, the eruption of a volcano. Um, I had been living, I was living in Hong Kong at the time, and shuttling back and forth to Manila, covering the, um, the, high, the political hijinks in, in the Philippines with uh, the fall of Marcos in 1986, and, and then seeing how Cory Aquino's government succeeded or failed in the subsequent years. And then suddenly, literally out of the clear blue sky, this enormous volcano called Mount Pinatubo erupted in, uh, began to erupt in March uh, 1991, and then in June there was a cataclysmic eruption. I had covered Mount St. Helens quite extensively when I lived in the States in the 1980s. This was a really enormous eruption, the second biggest of the century as it happens, only one bigger in the Aleutian Islands. Um, it was gigantic and it caused major loss of life. And um, oddly enough, I, just for a personal thing, I, mean, I, I covered it in great detail. And I went, when the eruption was over, and there was a crater lake uh, photographer, and I went off to have a look at it. And we went from a high rise hotel and we went in a helicopter and, and took off and flew over to the crater lake. And we took with us a, a kayak because we wanted to have some photographs of kayaking across the crater lake. So very sensibly, the photographer stood on a spit of land while I got into the kayak and paddled across this brilliantly green crater lake. And he told me, and I think I wanted to do it anyway, that I should paddle towards the bubbles that were still coming up in the middle. <laughs> but what I didn't realize was that the water by the bubbles was incredibly hot. And the kayak began to melt with the bow of the stern going up and me with my great weight coming down in the middle like that scene from Monsieur Hulot's holiday. So I managed to paddle myself to safety, but um, needless to pay, the owner of the, the kayak charged us a great deal of money for destroying his, his craft. But so that might have been a, a small footnote for casualty, but the main things that happened as a consequence of, with the eruption was that an enormous amount of southern Luzon was covered with thick, greasy, yellow mud. And that included two vitally important and very old American military bases. Um, Clark Air Base, which was just nine miles away from Pinatubo, and Subic Bay, which was on the coast, of course, to the west, about 20 miles away. And they were effectively inoperable as a consequence. They were used to evacuate people, Americans and others, from the eruption. But once the eruption was over, they were it was almost impossible to operate in them. And so, one by one, uh, they were closed down. Dick Cheney made the decision. Uh, Clark Air Base closed down in November 91, that same year. And uh, Subic Bay was closed in uh, 92. Slightly different reason, the Philippine Parliament didn't want the Americans there anymore for all sorts of complicated reasons. So we were effectively asked to leave, but we were happy to because we didn't want to clean up the base. So this effectively meant that the South China Sea went unpoliced because the ships and the aircraft moved back eastwards to Sasebo and Kuska and to Guam. And while the South China Sea was still within range, um, we were less interested in it, put it that way, than we had been before. We were concentrating our activities further north, near Korean waters and so forth. Well, two things that happened. The Chinese passed a law in 1992 effectively declaring um, the South China Sea uh, was part of their uh, sovereign territorial waters and started, three years later, strengthening, reinforcing, building on some of these, the many, many of these more or less uninhabited little islands and coral reefs and uh, excrescences of land that peppered the South China Sea, uh, the Spratleys in the south and the Paracels in the north. And I remembered years and years ago, I went on a container ship, a British container ship in Cardigan Bay from Port Klang in Malaysia to Hong Kong. And it was a routine voyage, but the captain was under instructions to sail as close as possible to the, uh, the Paracel Islands and took lots and lots of photographs. And when we arrived in Hong Kong Harbour, a British Royal Naval officer took the films away. So all British and Allied ships were aware that this was going on and we were trying to gather as much intelligence, but nothing was done. And it, that strikes me in retrospect as being both extraordinary and at the same time 
understandable, because the Chinese did it in a very, uh, and I don't mean to use the word cunning in a, in a pejorative sense, but they did it in a very stealthy way, taking one island at a time, putting a lighthouse here, putting a radio beacon there, putting a radar dome there, building a little airfield, a little dock, and for the Americans to bring in, you know, the carrier strike force seven or something and say, you mustn't build this lighthouse would seem ludicrously dis disproportionate. And so effectively nothing was done. A few clucking noises were made, but the Chinese got on with their policy of reinforcing almost any piece of solid land in the South China Sea. And then five or six years ago, uh, the Pentagon woke up to the realization that the South China Sea now was a quilt of Chinese claimed, claimed by many other people as well, but effectively a de facto, if not de jure, Chinese extension of its territory. You will be aware, of course, of the, what used to be called the 11 dash line, now the 9 dash line, which had been drawn by the Kuomintang um, to reflect the, the will of the post Potsdam world. And that was the basis of the, of the claim. It doesn't have much strength in law, but now de facto, the Chinese were there. And so this has led to, not the confrontation, but the situation we've seen in the last few weeks where um, the commanders in Hawaii have thought that freedom of navigation patrols must begin where destroyers, the last one a few weeks ago, and now another ship two days ago, sail as provocatively close to these islands as possible to demonstrate to the Chinese that these are not Chinese, the, the, and international waters, and we, everyone else, has every bit, a bit as much right as the Chinese do to be there. And of course the fear is that there'll be an accident or a confrontation. There have already been four. There's been the EP-3 when the um, American aircraft was forced, was damaged by a Chinese fighter that collided with the bottom of it in 2000, I think it was and forced it down onto Hainan Island. Um, there was the, um, the trouble with the USS Impeccable, which was a ship, uh, an American ship, uh, carrying a sonar array behind it, trawling, looking for submarines. Um, there was the business, more recently, of the USS Kalpens, a destroyer, following the Chinese aircraft carrier, the Liaoning, and getting into trouble doing that. And most notoriously of all, October 2006, when the USS Kitty Hawk, a rather elderly aircraft carrier, um, operating in the Philippine Sea, just north of the Philippines, was um, suddenly realized that there was a Song-class, state-of-the-art, new Chinese attack submarine following them just five miles away and uh, breaching their sort of ring of security that they had long thought was, um, was sacrosanct. So these, all of these incidents were resolved perfectly peaceably because the commanders involved were reasonable people. But the fear, I think, is that some, sooner or later, one of these American uh, insistences that uh, these are international waters will lead to some kind of accident, maybe some kind of, of confrontation. But of course, the Chinese strategy goes well beyond uh, the South China Sea, as I'm sure you're all aware, and it all goes back to this former PLA general who transferred to the Navy, or the PLA brackets Navy, uh, Liu Huaqing, who was instrumental in developing the 1992 territoriality law, and um, was instrumental too in planning not only the, uh, the seizing of the islands in the South China Sea, but also in the strategy of the first, the second, and the third island chains, um, these sort of imaginary bastions existing further and further out into the Pacific Ocean, the first island chain protecting, the, as it were, the green waters of China from Japan down to, uh, to Indonesia, and the second island chain running from Kamchatka to Cape York in Australia, and the third island chain from the Aleutian Islands via Midway in Hawaii down to uh, New Zealand. And it is the stated intention of, of, of Admiral Liu, General Liu that was, Admiral Liu that he was when he died, in 2011, that by 2020, the Chinese would be operating with impunity within the green waters within the first island chain, by 2030 within the second island chain, and by 2049, the 100th anniversary, of course, of the founding of the PRC, within <coughs> the third island chain, and that means operating 
carrier strike groups within view of the admirals sitting either in charge of the Pacific fleet at uh, Pearl Harbor itself or up in the hills of Camp Smith where Pacific Command is based. And that, of course, has given the Pentagon the polyballs or the heebie-jeebies and the <laughs> policies that are being adduced to deal with that are many and are complicated and all go, they have different names. There's the air sea battle concept and now what's called the JAM CG, the joint concept for access to the global commons, a ludicrous name in my view, and how the Americans intend to meet this threat. But is it a threat? And I think that's the question we all have to ask ourselves. Do the Chinese have any malign intent? I suggest they probably don't, that they simply want maritime equivalents. They're big, they're powerful, they're a nation justly proud who have been ill-treated by the West for all too long and are unlikely to forget. And they simply want to say, you've had the Pacific is the, your American, your private lake since the end of the Second World War. Well, we want to have the same thing. And remember, of course, they will say, uh, and I was reminded of this when I watched the other day, Film that I dare say you've all seen, The Sand Pebbles, with Candace Bergen and Steve McQueen, about American gunboats operating on the Yangtze in the 1920s and 1930s. Americans, French, British, Italian boats could operate on the Yangtze up to the head of navigation, 1800 miles about Shanghai, with impunity. And the concept of extraterritoriality meant that if any American or German or Italian or British sailor got into trouble, he would not be tried under the, in the courts of China but by the courts of his own country. Well, how would we feel if the Chinese decided that they wanted to run their ships up the Mississippi and uh, that if one of their sailors got into a fight in Hannibal, Missouri, uh, he should be tried not by the courts of the state of Missouri, but by courts back in China. And I think it's a perfectly reasonable thought. After all, the Chinese, as far as the Eastern Pacific is concerned, have not done any of the things that we have done. They didn't colonize, they didn't drop nuclear weapons, they didn't overfish, they didn't pollute, they didn't send their missionaries abroad and infect people or affect people in their religious beliefs. We have interfered. I don't believe that the Chinese intend on interfering, and consequently I believe, and this is entirely a personal view, which I'm happy to argue with you all, that the Chinese simply want equivalents, simply want the same rights that we have used, and I suspect that they will not misuse those rights in quite the way that we have, and therefore should be left alone. There we are, stand everyone into silence. <laughs> Good. I think that was a great brief tour through the book. By the way, the book will be on sale, and Simon will be around to, to autograph the book afterward. Um, I guess philosophically, you're talking about, you know, I, I think I had, in our little podcast, I quoted the penultimate page of the book, which is respect, reverence, accommodation, admiration, and awe for much that the East stands for. All these should now be the new watchwords. Practically speaking, I mean, it's not, you're an author and a generalist, but practically speaking, what does that mean the United States should be doing? I, in a specific practical sense, I think let's see what transpires. Let's, rather than provoking the Chinese, as I think they're doing now, I think there, there is a, a mood that the Chinese are dangerous, that they are, have bad intentions. And that we therefore need to, as we did with the Senkaku Islands, by flying those B-52s through the Aedes that they declared, um, that produced mercifully no reaction. And maybe this will produce no reaction. But why do it? Why not just accept that all the Chinese want is maritime equivalents and just leave it at that? Why do we have to enforce right of navigation, which is in no way being threatened by anyone? Only in our imagination is it being threatened. What, what your friends at PACOM will say is that we need the right to move our military vessels for intelligence purposes 
within the exclusive economic zones of all countries. So up to 12 miles from the land. And if we lose that right, that will ultimately make us less secure and potentially not allow us to protect shipping in that area. I guess that's the argument. I think it is, it is the argument, but I see no reason to believe that shipping would be threatened. I mean, why would the Chinese, how is it in their interests to threaten the trade routes? They need the trade every bit as much as we do. I mean, it is very beguiling. We go to Paycom, and obviously you've been many times, and the uh, people there show you photographs of what Seoul looked like in 1950 and what Seoul looks like today, and what Shanghai looked like in 1947 and how it looks today. And of course, they're very beguiling, these pictures of utterly devastated ruined cities populated with impoverished masses of people, now gleaming subways, skyscrapers, prosperity. And that, it is said, and this is, this is the mantra, is because these places have, and the trade routes that lead to and from them have been protected by a wall of American steel. Well, that may well be so, but I'm not sure that it is a thesis that necessarily doesn't deserve to be tested. I don't think a wall of Chinese steel is going to be any, mm -hmm. is going to be inimical to, to that. You've written this incredible book on the Pacific. When the next author, 30 years from now, undertakes a similar endeavor, or maybe you do it again. I will be 101. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's okay. I'm seeing people living to 106 these days, so it's okay. What do you think? I mean, you, you talk about so many of the problems of the Pacific, the environmental problems. You don't spend a ton of time on climate change and the, and the effect that that's going to have on the Pacific. Oh, with respect, I do. I think you must have glossed over I that. I must have glossed over yes. that. Yes, there's a great deal Well, the bleaching of the coral. No, 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 that's a different chapter. Hmm. So what do you think the Pacific looks like? Well, that's, okay. This is going to sound rather eccentric. When I did the Atlantic book, I discovered something which significantly altered my view of of the likely long-term future of this planet. In 1989, in the Caribbean, two scientists from Woods Hole, using a device called a flow cytometer, discovered in the waters of the Sargasso Sea a creature which they didn't know existed. It's called Prochlorococcus, and it is a single-celled algae which turns out now to be the most numerous creature on this planet. There are more prochlorococci in the warm waters of the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and the Pacific than any other creature on the planet. The extraordinary thing about prochlorococcus is that it absorbs carbon dioxide and emits oxygen, <coughs> such that one in five of the breaths that we are taking tonight are produced by creature that we didn't know existed before 1989. Well, now we do. We're discovering an awful lot of interesting things about it. And one is that it loves warm water. The warmer the waters get in the oceans of the world, the more of these prochlorococci there will be. Consequently, the more carbon dioxide they will absorb and the more oxygen they will emit. Their range, which is now from about 40 north to 30 south, will increase to 45 north to 35 south. And what the long-term effect of that is, and this is why I can imagine some of the rationalists here will dispute this, is that this suggests that the Gaia theory, the famous theory that the Earth is a self-regulating living mechanism, has this way in the specific matter of warming, of its ocean warming, has got a mechanism inbuilt to cure itself that things will get better. They won't get better in time for us. We will die. There's no doubt about it. We will be extinct very soon. And my old professor at Oxford, a paleontologist, and I think paleontologists are generally wise people, thought that we would be lucky to make it to 2300. In other words, another 260 years, 270 years. Others think even more gloomily that we may not make it for another 100 years. But 
And that's really what the argument about climate change is all about. We tend to think it's all about, you know, polar bears and rising sea levels and the people of Kiribati being forced out of their homes or whatever. But in fact, it's a very self-centered view. We care not so much about the climate, it so much as how the climate is going to affect us, make our cities uninhabitable, make our forests unexploitable, make our fish die. We will die, but the planet, thanks to things that we didn't even know existed 30 years ago, it will continue, it will flourish, it will get better. It always has in the past, and I dare say it always will too. Of course, the sun expands and obliterates the whole of the solar system. So James Lovelock and the Gaia theory is not to be discounted in my view. So the Pacific in 30 years will be much worse than it is today. But in 300 years, it'll be okay. But you're saying we won't be around. We won't be around. No. Wow. We certainly won't be around. None of us in this room, but none of our descendants either. Well, the, that's, our descendants won't be around. No. That's not heartening. I'd let some... <laughs> <laughs> Let's open the floor to questions from the audience. Bill? Yeah. Uh, on that optimistic note... I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm Bill Armbruster. I'm a retired journalist who covered container shipping for the Journal of Commerce and Shipping Digest magazine. And so I was intrigued by your earlier reference there to containerization. In fact, it was not until in, in the Pacific, uh, the Vietnam War, that uh, in the late 60s, that containerization really took off in the Pacific as a way of getting supplies to the troops in Vietnam faster. But I want to ask you, to what extent, or, or do you think that containerization contributed more to globalization than anything else. Or globalization uh, or global warming. Glo globalization, oh, well, yeah. well I, I, I think it has contributed. Hugely important development. I mean, uh, the, the man who invented it was... Uh, Not from McLean. McLean. Um, in, uh, yeah, and of course, from his experiences in, in the Korean War, wasn't it, when he saw army trucks loaded with boxes, and he thought, why can't we put things into boxes and standardize them that way? No, I have absolutely no doubt about it. I have a sort of personal stake in this because I, as I hope will be evident from this book, adore the sea and everything maritime. And I, 20 years ago, very much wanted to write a hymn to the way of marine or maritime life that had been extinguished as a result of the containerization, and that was the tramp steamer. Yeah. I was going to buy an 800 ton tramp steamer because there's, they're very cheap, you can buy them for a quarter of a million dollars in the Baltic, and I was going to crew it with caricatures of, of maritime life, you know, the dyspeptic um, radio, the, the misanthropic radio operator, the dyspeptic ill-tempered captain. I couldn't because I was colorblind, I'd have to sit in the owner's cabin. And we were going to go around the world, London to London or New York to New York, specifically going to bypassed ports and silted up estuaries and overlooked islands that had been made redundant because of container liner traffic, regular schedules between Yokohama and Long Beach, which undeniably has, has <coughs> resulted in the globalization of the world's economy, but made it a great deal less romantic. I mean, a less romantic thing than a container ship, you can, I'm sure you made them romantic in your writings, but nonetheless, they're pretty ugly things. But there's this other thing. The, the Germans are particularly good at this, tracking the, the exhaust plume, fume, sorry, plumes from container ships um, across the great oceans. And you see, I think it's a university in Hamburg which is doing it. You can see the amount of particulate matter which comes out of the funnels, leaving aside what's thrown over the sides and dumped from the bunkers of container ships. Um, these patterns, you see lines all across the Atlantic where hovering in the atmosphere above the shipping lanes are these enormous tonnages of highly noxious um, greenhouse gases. So globalization and global warming, both your ships are to blame, I'm afraid. Well, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well aware. <laughs> Isaac. Uh, thanks, person. Colorful remarks on uh, the U.S. China maritime dynamics. I just want to push back a little bit on the story about China seeking maritime equivalence and suggest that 
they were already invited to maritime equivalence. That's the nature of the law of the sea regime that they're in, and that's sort of the purpose of the U.S. <coughs> freedom of navigation operations is to say that the rules to which China's agreed to and to which the United States uh, has no cons consents to, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> treats 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 as customary international law, but that's independent of it. The, the idea that China is is clawing back some equivalence because it's been excluded from the rights, I think, is not is not a, an accurate telling of the story. Um, and another element of the story that I think is significant is that this was not a mystery. These various salami slicing tactics were not a mystery to analysts, uh, certainly in Hawaii and in Washington and elsewhere in the region. And a lot of the more recent attention has been in response to China's coercion of its neighbors. And so I think you'd have a much harder time in Hanoi or Tokyo or Manila or a variety of other places telling the story about uh, a peaceful China just wanting maritime equivalents. We've seen the practical changes being China seizing more territory, developing more capacity, and practically excluding use by other actors. Uh, and I think glossing over that part of the story just does a, does a bit of a disservice to the, to the public in terms of understanding these dynamics. And I certainly have not been invited to speak uh, in Hanoi or Manila or <laughs> Jakarta about this, and I dare say you're right. No, I think, I think it's, a, it's a very fair point to make, but the bottom line is why are we so fearful of it? Are we fearful of it? Do we think they are actually going to, in some way, make, uh, make trouble? I mean, other than small regional arguments. Are they going to interdict the shipping lanes in any serious way or at all, in fact? I think the theory is that commerce is upheld by the fact of freedom of navigation for military vessels, and certainly China depends on shipping in the South and East China Seas and throughout the Pacific, uh, more so than, than virtually any other state in the history uh, of the world, but by not seeking maritime equivalents, but rather seeking exclusive control over an important area, they create the capacity to do that at their will. Uh, and you know that's one of the reasons that they feel vulnerable to the US Navy operating there is that their view is that at some point, if there were to be a, a serious conflict, that the U.S. Navy could interdict its oil supplies coming through Malacca uh, or otherwise interfere with it. And it's, you know, in that sense, there is maybe they are seeking equivalence, but it's a, it's a zero sum sort of thing. And so the destabilizing thing and the thing that is changing is that China now wants that wants that authority. And so I think, you know, a, a story of just a, a benign uh, quest for equivalence, I think. D doesn't tell doesn't tell us what's going on. So you would favor arbitration? Uh, I think some type <laughs> keep losing the market. discussion to be taken taken uh, uh, offline. But yeah, I think appealing to international law is, is a useful and practical way for the United States and China to manage this. Well, that might be better than saving the lesson close to the Spratly Islands. If the Chinese would agree, of course. And maybe that's the result of maybe that's what's going to happen with the meetings that are going on at the moment. Maybe they are agree to it. Thank you. Uh, what, what, did you talk to the, by chance the Pacific Conference in Singapore? Uh, you mean the, um, the, what do you call it, the Shangri La Conference? Well, 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 by different names, but when I was out there and you were shipping through the Malacca Straits, uh, I was a big institute. We worked with them very closely. And they, Pacific Conference are made up of the maritime nations who service that area. We did not have a maritime service, and so we were not going to, I mean, the, the U.S. Navy or our government <coughs> was not invited to participate. And they came in the north one day, government officials in Washington said, look, we don't want you to use, to use the Pacific Conference anymore. Use non-conference shipping, and we'll push our, we want to be, be a member of this. And I said, well, you can't be a member. Not, we don't have a maritime. Well, that doesn't matter for us. We should be in that, and that's a true story. Mm. You know, and but the answer is, I, I did control these ships as they go down south, mm -hmm. in, out, in, out of Japan, out of Korea, out of China, and as they get close to the Malacca Straits, the Pacific Council picks them up and lines them up so they put them on the Great Circle Rule. Once they get through it, they aim and into the Suez. And that's control. And I don't know why we, we, we fight that. Well, I was not at the conference. You were at the conference, were you? No, I wasn't. I worked out there. I oh, right, right. every uh, 10 years. I shipped 
and ready to grab batteries that all the companies we didn't have a plan. Right. So that Go ahead. I'm just curious what your take on uh, the Chinese claim that the South China Seas was actually given to them by the Allies after World War II for China's contribution in defeating Japan because Japan had basically occupied that whole area and since they lost. Mm -hmm. um, well, that was, that, that was why the Kuomintang map was drawn, the 11 dash line. Right. And that's so what if the, it was subject to international law and court with that hold, I'm just, I'm just trying to understand how, you know. This well, it is my happen. understanding, but the gentleman with the beard that was talking earlier, do you know the answer to this? I mean, they claim that the Potsdam Conference awarded all the former Japanese uh, territories in the South China Sea to the victors who were in that particular. So it, doesn't, it doesn't name any of the territories similarly in the East China Sea. So right. Just, both sides are trying to exploit ambiguity in it. Um, right. China has a, has a claim. They could bring it to court, and a court would review all the evidence, and they'd make a determination. So, so there's your answer. Lawyers need to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> better, better than the sailors. I think we have used our time, but what you've got is a flavor of what is in this book. It is available for sale outside, and the author has promised to stay for about 10 minutes. Longer, I think. Ten, 15 I minutes. I just want to make the 7.52 train. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, to sign it. So please join me in thanking Simon for both being here and writing this wonderful book.